Hey, hey, all you mentees, this is the Uncanny Omar from Near Mint Condition, and join me today for an advanced look at some collected editions coming out from Marvel Comics this week. So, let's get started. Alright, before getting started, a huge thank you to David Gabriel and the fine folks at Marvel for sending us advanced copies of these collected editions. All of these books are due out in the direct market on March 24th and then a couple of weeks later in the book market. So we got a couple of epics, a Marvel Select, but let's go ahead and get started and talking about the Werewolf by Night trade paperback here. All right, Werewolf by Night is the very first book we're going to be looking at. New Wolf Rising, and we'll talk about that title and what it means here in a second, but here's what the back looks like. Retails for $15.99 and the spine. And of course, I'll be going through all the spines here soon. So New Wolf Rising. If you're a fan of the character of Jack Russell, well, it's not his story. It's a brand new story by Taboo and B. Earl. Pencilers are Scott Eaton, Scott Hanna uh, is the inker, and then Miroslav Mer Merva is the colorist. So I do have to talk about the Song of the Wolf here in a little bit, but let's talk about the book. So you won't find the character of Jack Russell in here. There's a brand new character, and his name is Jake Gomez, who lives in the Hopi um, reservation and he has the ability to become a werewolf by night now together with his girlfriend they help fight all these little uh, hunters uh, people that are kidnapping other kids and things like that now she and him have learned with the help of um, his grandmother now there is another character in here from old school marvel and that is the character of red wolf who looks a little bit different who's been uh, in the Avengers and has been a big part of the Marvel Universe for a long time. So it's nice to see him show up in this particular book. So, yeah, here is um, Jake with his girlfriend, Molly, and then uh, his grandmother, Rora. And together, they are, they are both of these ladies are kind of like his main driving force. They are the people that he looks up to the most because, um, you know, he has issues with his father and slowly you get to find out how long he's had this power to become a werewolf and how he's been using it. But I mainly wanted to show off some of the artwork here. I think it's a nice take. You know, it's a modernization of the story of Werewolf by Night with a new interesting cast. And I want to see more of these kids. I love this uh, spread page right here. More of these characters show up later on, including Red Wolf, who I think he's got another series. And all of this happened. I didn't even know about the series, honestly, because it all happened during the uh, when we got hit by the pandemic. These books started coming out. I think it was released digitally first and then we got physical copies. I'm not. I'm not 100% sure, but I know I, I didn't even hear about this until I got the solicitations for Werewolf by Night. I didn't know it was a new character or anything, but I had a lot of fun reading this. It's a quick read. Let me show you one of the coolest things in here. So you have the Song of the Wolf here. This, of course, comes from the Hopi Reservation, and then the steps are all drawn in here. I love this spread pages here. So one, two, three... 14 different steps and they're all drawn out and labeled for you. thought that was a really cool addition. Now let's look in the back here for some extras. So here in the back we have an afterward letter after the first issue. Uh, this is from Taboo and B and Ben, uh, the two creators, the two writers. And then we have some thumbnails here by B Earl for the first issue. Um, some character sketches. Now, one thing you're probably asking is why in the world have I not said that Taboo is one of the Black Eyed Peas? Well, I didn't want to bring that up until the very end because I wanted to talk about the book. And I, you know, I think it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're Steven Spielberg or one of my favorite authors, I think you still have to earn, um, you know, that place in writing comics. I think, you know, a lot of the times, People assume because you're somebody big, you could just come in and start writing comics, and it's easy. But it's not an easy task. We've seen that again, like famous people come in and write comics, and they just kind of fail. Actually, let's go back here for a second and appreciate this classic, what is known as a gem variant, uh, Mike Plug variant. So it's a classic picture, and all they did was add modern colors to it. And that is a kick-ass James Stucco variant. The book has 112 pages and collects the five issue miniseries of the Werewolf by Night that came out in 2020. All right, let's look at the next book. 
Next up is Conan the Barbarian Into the Crucible. This book retails for $17.99, and it does have a parental advisory, basically because of the violence, and that's a, that's about it. Uh, this is the Jim Sub series, series, uh, series, and it's drawn by Roge Antonio, Robert Gill, Luca Pizarra, and Israel Silva is the main colorist. We have some variants uh, on the opposite page of the standard cover, the regular cover. And this collects issues 13 through 18 of the 2019 Conan series. So this takes place after the events of Jason Aaron's run on Conan the Barbarian that are available in trade paperback as well as an oversized hardcover. Now, I think it looks like just from based on his age and his experience that this story might take place before those stories that Jason Aaron wrote, though. So this is called the Into the Crucible story. And it's practically a contest of champions, if you will. And Conan kind of gets pushed, well, yes, physically gets pushed into this crucible where he has to fight to the death against all these characters that he just met, including a young boy that has kind of been helping him out and speaks his language. And of course, there's booby traps everywhere, but the contest will be determined as to who wins when the final person is left standing so it's almost like a battle royale and there's um well that's not much of a spoiler conan lives it's not like he dies in this but anyway um not everything seems uh, what it is at first so he makes alliances through these pages and of course there's imminent betrayal people can't trust each other and it feels like an interesting take on a conan story like i said it, it's like a contest of champions but it's a battle to the death and and when i said betrayals of course you tend to think that okay conan's gonna work this out no matter what but at the end of the day, you're reminded that, oh, it's a Conan story. Of course it's going to be brutal. Of course it's not going to go the way that you think it's going to go. Of course the people that he's bonding with... Well, never mind. I will let you find out for yourself. That's what the first story arc is. And then we get a two-parter in the back that focuses more on this blade that Conan is wielding. And this is drawn by two different artists, but there's some great visuals back here. Including the colors are really nice. And the colors really help bring this series together. Uh, so this particular book has 144 pages, and as I said, retails for $17.99. Now you saw some of the variants in the front. Let's look in the back here. I am censoring that last page because I think this is very important. Uh, if you saw during the Crucible, a lot of those characters spoke different languages. Well, this is really cool because Jim Sub actually wrote the languages out, and the translations are right here in the back. So I thought that was really cool, because as I'm reading it, I thought they were just speaking gibberish, and I kind of passed over some of those word bubbles, but it's nice to go back and see what those characters are actually saying. Here are some variants in the back. Some of them are smaller than others, and then you have some layout pages back here. And this uninked and uncolored variant right here by... Alexander Lozano. Yeah, that's beautiful. Next up is the Marvel Select Edition Punisher. Welcome back, Frank. And I've talked about these before. I've actually given a list. I uh, made a video on all the books that are coming out from Marvel last year sometime. But this is the editorial picks for the stories that best represent the characters. And for Frank Castle, they went with Welcome Back, Frank. And honestly, as much as I love Carl Potts and those years of Chuck Dixon and Mike Barron, I think... This is probably the best representation of Frank. And just to give you a heads up, they are the size of the trade paperback. So they're as tall as a trade paperback. They are just, they look a little bit taller because they're hard covers. There are no dust jackets or anything, but it's just the art on the board. But they are hard covers. So the Punisher, welcome back, Frank. What What is this? So I don't know. Um, I've done an overview of this. I've done a review of the book on Old Reader, New Reader. So this is Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon's take on Frank Castle. So Marvel in 2000 started this new Marvel Knights line where they kind of... I don't want to say matured up the characters because there have always been mature stories. But they did... You know, there was no longer the comics code, and they could get away with more stories. And all this, of course, led into the Max series, which is definitely for adults, and they could do all kinds of things. So we have Frank Castle coming back 
to doing what he does best. Now, his line had been discontinued for quite a number of years, and this is Garth Ennis kind of putting him uh, back on the map, bringing him back home, if you will. So he's living in this apartment complex with, uh, who is it, uh, Spacker Dave, Joan, and Gumbo, the big guy. And all of this, most of this book was actually borrowed heavily for the... What, what what year did that come out? 2005 Punisher with Thomas Jane? But, oh, and you have these beautiful covers here by Tim Bradstreet. He supplies all the covers. So, yes, this does all take place. Um, this original series came out in 2000. So it, it does predate the 9-11. So that's why you saw the Twin Towers. And it's the story of Frank just taking out the bad guys. And then some bad guys coming after him. He makes enemies of the mob like he always does. And damn, I love this story. I, I, I agree with the editors on this one. This is 100% the story I would have chosen to best represent Frank Castle. There's also these um, characters that we're introduced to that are doing their own punishing. And they kind of look up to the Punisher. I love the way... <laughs> Anyway, no, if you've not read it, you're you're in for a treat. This is one of the best Punisher books, if not the best Punisher book for a lot of people. And this book right here retails for $29.99, so it's a little bit bigger than most of your Marvel Select stories and has 288 pages. And let's keep going, just looking at some of the... Yeah, I love, love the people that he lives with and how they take care of each other. And even the ending is bittersweet, but... Uh, let me see if they have anything extra in the back here. So we have a couple of variants in the back by Steve Dillon, a phenomenal artist. This is the manifesto of Garth Ennis's Punisher and the script, a little bit of the script. It's pretty much all you have back here. There's a team up with Daredevil that I thought was, oh man, the team up with Daredevil is dark. Just the things that he makes Matt Murdock do, or you think that he's gonna do but anyway you're in for a treat if you've not read this time to hit those pause buttons all you spine watchers here you go here's what all the spines look like together for the books coming out this week all right next up is fantastic four this is the new printing of the epic collection volume two the master plan of dr doom retailing for 39 dollars and 99 cents and contains issues 19 through 32 of the fantastic four as well as the first annual and second annual i think it kicks off with the first annual if i'm not mistaken so all of this written by stan lee and drawn by jack kirby yeah does kick off with the return of everybody's favorite atlantean namor the submariner and Again, it's this whole love triangle between him, Sue, Storm, and Reed Richards. And he just wants to get her attention. But honestly, during this volume right here, because I know this from the Omnibus edition, this is when I started to notice that Stan Lee is actually getting um, used to his writing. He's, he's sharpening his writing skills. And Jack Kirby is also just mastering his art. Like, he is getting it to the point of perfection in a way that by the time you get to the end of this volume i think jack kirby is the jack kirby that we all know and love because he's still rough around the edges and i hate saying that about the king you know but it's true towards the beginning of the first volume and the beginning of this second volume i'm sorry towards the beginning of this volume and the very first volume some of the art is still a little rough. Oh, so we have brand new characters like the molecule man makes his first appearance here as well as rama tut here he is, the Pharaoh from the future. <laughs> Boy, does he have a complicated uh, origin, especially when you throw in Kang and Immortus. But that's a story for another day. We have the introduction of the hate monger, but then you have your classic characters back like Mole Man, Doctor Doom, Namor that you saw. There's some hit and miss stories in this one. I particularly remember the one about the baby from space. Uh, yeah, that one. Not the biggest fan of that story. But... I do appreciate a lot of the artwork and what it's evolving into. Uh, there's also big appearances here. A lot of guest stars here, like by the Avengers. Uh, you've got the Hulk, Spider-Man. Um, I think Xavier makes an appearance in here. Yeah, there's the Avengers. And, of course, Namor ain't giving up. Here we go. Here we get some Jack Kirby stuff. There's the X-Men. Very nice. Red Ghost comes back, Diablo. 
So this particular book has 448 pages. I love that cover. That's the annual number two cover, which is his origin story. I think this is the first time they talked about Dr. Doom, uh, as far as like a true origin of Dr. Doom. They hinted at it, and we've seen a little bit here and there, but this is the origin of Dr. Doom. Here we have the Invincible Man and the death of a hero. Oh man, which of the Fantastic Four is going to stay dead forever? Jack Kirby, that's right, doing some early stuff that you'll see a lot of in the pages of The Coming of Galactus. I like that he's experimenting, and you get to see that transition. It's really cool to go back and see this, especially if you're doing it for the first time, to learn and appreciate how somebody like that just perfect, perfects his craft, at least in my eyes. All right, let's look in the back here. A couple of house ads in the back. Uh, you also have some original pages. Very cool. Unused cover. Unused cover. Man, where the heck is that reciting? Unused cover pencils here by Jack Kirby. Can you imagine owning an unused cover? Original uh, art. Look at that. Look, damn, Sue. Okay. Now, of course, that's ink by Geo Bell, but... Anyway, where was I? Uh, yes, you also have the covers here to the Masterworks, Volume 1, Volume 2, and 3. And they also throw... I thought they had included Volumes 1 and 2 in the first Epic Collection, but I guess all four of them are included here. 448 pages, $39.99. This is a new printing, so this one here is printed at the Fry Communications, which this and the X-Men book um, have... I've seen a lot of people reach out to me asking me what my thoughts are. And honestly, it's one of these things where sometimes I don't get reprints. So I have the original one that I'm showing. And they were talking about the issue that I had with the um, with the omnibus that I did yesterday, the Defenders omnibus, where you can see the art on the opposite page. But honestly, in this one, I'm not seeing it. I don't know if it's my... It, it can't be just my copy because I think they're all the same i don't without holding it to a light like that then i can see the opposite page but if it's laying down like this i don't see it whereas on the let me see if i can find a white page so i'm trying to find pages where there's a bunch of white and of course i'm failing um but there is some white in this one now i'm not seeing any of the artwork on the opposite page until i hold it up to a light because, I mean, well, as I'm flipping through here, you can see for yourself, too. I, I hope the video comes out through. Uh, but, yeah, as I'm lifting it, yeah, you can see. But that's normal when you have thin paper like this. Or thinner paper. This isn't the paper that they used in the past with Epic Collections. But then, again, it's like to keep costs down, you have to have that. So, yeah, I'm not seeing it much on this one. We'll look at the X-Men together. So here we have X-Men Epic Collection, The Sentinels Live. This is a new printing. And here's the spine and the back. This is Volume 3, years 1968 to 1970. Uh, collecting X-Men 46 through 66. And then material from Kazars 2 and 3 and Marvel Tales number 30. Nice Neil Adams print there. With the cover. We'll talk about the printing quality of this one here in a second. Or you can see for yourself as I flip through here. So we have the end of the X-Men. This is it. No more X-Men after this. As a matter of fact, after this volume, it does get canceled. X-Men is canceled after issue 66. And we'll talk a little bit that, about that here in a second. So this is after Roy Thomas leaves. The X-Men are distraught because Professor X is gone. A little bit of a spoiler there, but you get to find out for yourself how exactly that happened. And does Professor X come back? I hope you know the answer to that by now if you're watching this video. But here we have the X-Men being handled by different writers. I think Arnold Drake eventually comes. Yeah, Arnold Drake. Come, boy, that's a nice picture there by Don Heck. Arnold Drake, who used uh, the Doom Patrol. Doom Patrol, that's right. Um, comes in and writes some of these stories. And then we eventually get Neil Adams coming in. But let me find a couple of issues that Steranko did. So those are ones that stood out to me. All right, so you have the classic Steranko cover. And Steranko also is uncredited for creating the new X-Men logo. This is the logo that they've used for decades. You know, we're used to seeing this logo here before 
Steranko came on board. So he worked, I think it was just two issues, issues 50 and 51, but man, are they solid issues. So we're introduced to the daughter of Magneto, Polaris here, we're introduced to Havoc through these pages, uh, Sauron makes an appearance here, and yeah, this and this one right here, written by Arnold Drake, all have Steranko artwork. And you can always tell a Steranko comic because his art really stood above the rest. Now, let's get to the Neil Adams. Speaking of standing above the rest. All right. So here we have the secret of Havoc. And Roy Thomas comes back here. Don Heck is on pencils. And this is the Living Pharaoh, a character that has ties to Havoc, Alex Summers. And you get to find out how Alex Summers got away and why we haven't even heard of him this whole time but the biggest thing that happened here is neil adams coming on board and drawing these issues of x-men starting with issue 56 oh, this is so such a powerful uh just image right there that they you know john byrne later on used it in the issue 135 of the dark phoenix saga so one of the things that nobody really talks about though is really the the star of all of this so we talk about roy thomas you know you hear enough about him and you hear enough about neil adams this run is is stellar but you don't hear of the unsung hero and that is tom palmer tom palmer's doing all the inks on this and it is just amazing i mean yes neil adams is the penciler and yes we we love him and all his art and you know up until at this point, X-Men was just kind of dull, honestly. And bringing back the Sentinels. Yeah, the Sentinels live story with these new characters playing a bigger role. And just this amazing artwork. Tom Palmer just brings it all together. I love I love his inks. And I don't think he gets enough praise. He is truly the underdog of this era right here. So this is kind of like the last hurrah for Roy Thomas and the X-Men. Um, actually, Chris Claremont helped out with this plot. I um, don't know if most of you know that, but look at that. That is so badass. Great artwork. Uh, and here's the introduction of Sauron here. Then the X-Men make it back to America. But what I was saying is that, yes, sadly, even though this is a great story... Oh, you finally get to see Magneto without his helmet, too, the first time. Up until then, you've seen just Magneto with a helmet. So they didn't even know the guy, you know, had gray hair. But he's creating his own little mutates down there with L'Oreal. And this is the story where Kazar appears and Magneto's got a new outfit. But anyway, uh, my point is that even though... Oh, the introduction of Sunfire. Damn it, I keep stopping. Okay, sorry. Even though the, they brought it back and the stories were fun again, it just wasn't enough and X-Men was canceled. As of issue 66, they canceled X-Men. And then, you know... Issue 67, 68, they were all reprints of older stories. That's all they were doing. They, they still kept the title going. I think it became, it came out twice um, every two months. But it was just, you know, it just didn't sell. Until Len Wein and Dave Cockrum came back with Giant Size X-Men number one. And that forever changed everything for X-Men. Then it became, you know, it took a little bit after that with Chris Claremont joining Dave Cockrum and, and then eventually John Byrne and Terry Austin. Then it became its flagship title, Marvel's flagship title. But up until then, it just, you know, it got canceled. And I don't blame them. There's, there's a rare story here by Jerry Siegel, the co-creator of Superman, writing the story of Angel. And this reads like a Golden Age story. I haven't read it in a few years, but I do remember reading it. And I'm like, man, this does not read like Warren Worthington III that I know. Uh, but it's interesting to see this era of X-Men and what led to the cancellation. Because, yeah, these stories, you know, before this just weren't the best. And you can find out for yourself, though. You may end up loving some of those stories and be like, what the hell is Omar talking about? Those stories were phenomenal. Let's look in the back here for some extras. Look at that original Steranko art. Bad, unused cover. Oh, it's so badass. I've seen a lot of this in the, um, the Omnibus before. Here's the color guides. It's so cool. It's a lot of extras. This book has 512 pages. And retails for $39.99. I never did like this image right here from the... Is this Visionaries, I think? Yeah, X-Men Visionaries, Neil Adams. It, it's his new modern 
art style with mod modern colors. I don't know. I think I would have liked this image in black and white more. Recap pages and then the Marvel Masterworks Volume 6 cover. Now, let's talk about the paper in this because, like I said, this is also another Fry Communications copy. Now, maybe it's the lighting. Hold on. Let me do something. All right. <laughs> I have turned on every light in this room, so you're going to get a little bit of glare, but it's just to see if the art is coming through as people have uh, written me emails. Okay. So on this page, and keep in mind, like I said, every freaking light in this room is on and pointed at this book right now, but down here you can see the frames from the opposite page. When there's color, you can't really tell. And I'm glad we have Neil Adams because that Fantastic Four by Jack Kirby, they were pretty much stapled frames. And let's see. Let me, let me try to find a page here with some lots of white. So here's a page with lots of white. And you can tell the frames on the opposite page. Can't really make out what they are. Maybe that's Sauron. I think that's Sauron. Until you hold it up closer to a light. Nope, not Sauron. It's a demon. Let me see if I can find another one. Hey, Eric the Red. What a confusing getup that was for Cyclops. Especially when they bring him back the character during Dave Cockrum's years. Okay. So on the opposite page is the cover. And I guess you can tell a little bit. I don't know if you can tell in the video, but I can tell just a little bit of the art is bleeding through. And I don't want to use that word bleeding through. Ah, here we go. Down here. Over here. There's some frames you can tell in the back. But again, like I said, keep in mind, all the lights are pointed at this book. Bother some people, but I wanted to be thorough. Especially for the a few people that have emailed me about the Fry Communication books. So, that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing these books, don't forget to check out our sponsor, CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online source for collected editions up to 50% off retail price. Cheap Graphic Novels prides itself on excellent packaging, so your stuff gets to you in excellent condition, and they have amazing customer service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And for all you minties that are watching, if you're a first-time customer, don't forget to mention that Near Mint Condition sent you their way for a promotional credit on free shipping on your next order. Now, this is only for U.S customers. CheapGraphicNovels.com, your source for the hottest books with deep discounts, customer service, and excellent shipping that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content and page count of each of these books. Let me know in the comments down below which ones you're picking up. Are you a fan of the epic collections? Are you getting any of the Marvel Select lines for yourself or to give away to somebody? What do you think of the Conan the Barbarian? Are you hoping that they'll do an OHC like they did with the Jason Aaron run? And if you haven't checked out Werewolf by Night, I thought it was a really fun book. Again, this was The Uncanny Omar. Thank you all so much for watching. Please don't forget to hit that like button. Ring that bell for notifications to let you know when our videos are going live. We can be found on Spreadshop and on Patreon. Amazing ways to support the channel. And don't forget, our Spreadshop merchandise is 15% off here for the next couple of weeks. And it's an amazing way to support the channel while you get to wear some cool gear. And, again, Uncanny Omar here signing off. Everybody stay healthy, stay safe, and much love.